Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 559. And today, Andrew and I are talking about children training with adults. Yeah, there's Andrew waving. If you are checking this out on YouTube, you'll see a video version of the episode. But of course, in your podcast feed, it's going to be audio because that's just how we do it. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, joined by Andrew Adams. And why do we do this? We do it because we love martial arts. We love traditional martial arts. And that's what Whistlekick's all about. If you want to see what we've got going on at Whistlekick, go to whistlekick.com. You can check out all the stuff that we have available for sale. And if you find something you like, you know, helps out the show. And you can even save 15% with the code PODCAST15. Now, if you want to see what's going on with this show, it's on a separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes every week, and it's to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists around the world. And... You know, this is a good example because Andrew, you and I connected because of Whistlekick, and now we're entertained and we've educated each other, and it just it continues to spread, right? It's just it's one of those things. It's a full circle. It is. It is. Everything's going for full circle. If you're watching, you can see that I'm reading my notes. And if you like the work that we do here, if, if you want to help us out, yeah, you can make a purchase. You could, but you could also share an episode. You could leave us a review on whatever podcast platform you use. Or you could join the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. We bring you new stuff. Lately, I've been posting chapters of the novel that I'm writing over there because it's a martial arts-esque novel. And uh, actually, I finished chapter the third chapter last night. So that's going to go up today. And just to those of you out there helping out, I appreciate you. We appreciate you. So, Andrew, we got we got something a little bit different today this kind of led from a listener question which uh, which is great i love to get these yeah yeah this is a lot of fun it makes it you know as as you might imagine coming up with stuff to talk about can take some time and whenever you're putting together the content you wonder are people going to like this and most of the time the answer is yes but in this case we've got somebody who wrote in and we're going to answer their question. We're, well, I shouldn't say answer because it's not that cut and dry, but we are going to talk about the subject that they have raised. And so I'm about to read this. Is there anything you want to add in before I, I read what they wrote? No, no, go ahead. Okay. All right. And as we would do normally, we're not going to name the name and there's nothing personally identifying in this, but if we if we had something like that, we would edit it a little bit unless the person explicitly says, go ahead, read my name. So here we go. My dojo is smaller. So while we have kids class and adult class, there is no teen class. It's a harder style of karate, an offshoot of Kyokushin. And while I trust my sensei's judgment, he has started putting young teenagers into class with adults. While we're on Zoom, it's fine, but I'm not sure how I feel about sparring. My main concern is that they are still children. And although they may be tall, it just doesn't feel right to fight a child with the amount of contact we use. As a second matter, in our tournaments, they are allowed more protective gear, including chest pads and helmets, than we are. So I expect them to train as they would for a tournament. I know this makes some people feel uncomfortable as well. Since we're still on Zoom, it hasn't become an issue yet, but I was just curious on your thoughts as to, one, when children should train with adults, and two, what special treatment, if any, they should be afforded. I have helped teach kids' classes in the past and participate in their testing, and I can say it's a fairly sizable jump from kids' class to adult. On top of it, they will come in outranking almost all of the adults, which makes going soft on them or giving special treatment even harder to navigate. So when, Andrew, was this still part of the question or do we get into your notes? No, this this is kind of some of my notes here. Okay, these are your notes. So let's let's leave it there and and we can can start chatting. Um, It's an important question and it's a question that occurs in probably martial arts classes just about everywhere and not just martial arts but pretty much anything because the transition from kid to adult is is gray right you can point at uh you know we're someone our age and say that these are clearly adults you could point at a six-year-old and say that is clearly a child but there there comes a time whether it's adolescence or teen years or depending on the subject matter even 20s i mean the way a, a kid in college learns Right. I just said a kid in college, not an adult at college, a young yeah, adult in yeah. college. Right. Depending on the context, that age can shift. I, I even I have friends who've said, you know, basically anybody under 40 is a kid. <laughs> and may, maybe not as relevant to what we're talking about today, but I 
I think you could still make a point for that. It, it becomes very nebulous, the difference between quote unquote kids and adults. Um, it, 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 like you said, the subject matters. And in this case, we're talking martial arts. And even within martial arts, I think there can be made, be made a case that it varies from the school depending on the kind of school. The, yeah. um, this particular person was talking about their school being an offshoot of Kyokushin. Um, for those that, that are listening that might not realize, Kyokushin is known for very hard, full contact sparring. Yeah. Um, they don't do you know punches or kicks to the head. Um, that's not allowed, but you know, they're going full force with but very little- kick into the leg. And if oh, you've yeah. ever eaten up a if you've ever trained with a Kyokushin fighter and they leg kick you, ooh, brutal. Absolutely. Um, and so I think that style of sparring is definitely different than other styles, um, which right. I think changes where that line may be in a school. Absolutely. So I think, you know, we could probably spend an hour discussing the philosophy of different iterations, but I want to make sure that we talk about specifically what's going on in this person's school. And I think that there will be some people who can infer information for what we might say about their school. We're probably going to get some generalities thrown in here somewhere, but instead of, you know, making this a long conversation, let's try to be a little focused and, and talk about what's going on for this person. So as they said, on Zoom, doesn't really matter. When we're talking about forms or basics, doesn't really matter. Where does it come into play? It comes into play when we have partner work, and I would say specifically free-form partner work, where a level of contact, 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 I was trying to combine contact and context, a level of contact is expected. Because, yeah, at the time, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of myself, right? We tend to think about our own personal circumstances. And I'm thinking about myself at 13, wearing a brown belt with plenty of competency, knowledge, but I was 5'3", five, 5'4", five, and 110 pounds. Yep. Right? Like, yeah, I could, if, I, if I kicked you in the head, it would hurt. But if you kicked me in the head, I might die. Absolutely. And, I, and maybe I'm being a bit sarcastic with that, but there's still a reality there that most teenagers are capable of causing more harm than they're able to handle. Their bodies are not fully developed yet. They, they just aren't. They're not right. continued. They're not. They are still continuing to develop and grow and their bones are still getting strong. And uh, absolutely. I think that makes a difference. And I think as important, if not more important, their mind's not fully developed. And depending on what scientific research you're looking at, it's really, it's about 25 years old now. We're saying that the brain continues to develop up until then. And when we think about teenagers, you know, we think about 12, 13, 14 year olds, someone who might be tall. I mean, you've got plenty of kids that age who are six feet tall. It's not rare. It happens. But yet their impulse control doesn't exist in the way that a fully formed adult's brain does. And that matters. So how do we how do we navigate this? You know, I think we can look at this specific instance from two perspectives. How would I handle this? How how would we handle this maybe as instructors? And how do I handle this as a student? Because as a student, you've got much less authority, but you still have to play by the rules. Yeah. Um, for one of the things that I've often said and will always continue to say about everything is that to me, it's all about open, clear communication. Yeah. You know, understanding what is expected, you know, your instructor should be having discussions with the adults when there are kids coming in so that the adults know how to handle this type of situation, you know, and and the question herein lies, um, as the question asker mentioned, do we, I'll put myself in that situation. If I'm in that school, do I go easy on that student, on that child, because they're only 13 or 14 years old? Or do I go full force? Well, obviously, I would never go full force with a 14-year-old. But is the instructor expecting me to do that? I don't know because they haven't given me any communication as to what they expect. Sure. I think for me, when I think about this situation, I'm, I'm reflecting back. I've trained in a lot of schools. And in almost everyone, there are implicit 
rules of engagement. Whether or not you realize it, there are rules of engagement, and they're they're comprised of the rules that the instructor has set down either globally or, or that specific day. And then there's space usually in between that for the people participating to establish their own rules. Here's a great example. I generally, unless someone's being a jerk, don't care how hard someone goes sparring me. As long as they understand I'm going to go that hard back. And that's, you know, we, we probably all experienced this. We start working with someone and they're just either they're having a bad day or they don't realize what's going on. And, and this is a specific that a lot of kids will go through. They, their bodies grow. They get stronger from seeming weak to weak at times. And they don't realize that they're hitting so hard. And so I'll tell them, are you OK with me going as hard with you as you are with me? And that usually settles people down because, oh, well, no, I, I'm not OK with that. All right. Well, then, then tone it down. So there, mm -hmm. there's that space in between that we start talking about how to arrange it. And I think, as you say, communication, if we are willing to take a second before class, after class, during class to start a dialogue, or even when we, when we bow, when we start working together, hey, let's not go as hard as we did last time. You know, something like that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I again, communication. You know, as long as everyone knows what's going on, I think that's important because some might make the argument that if I am as an adult, I'm going easy on the on the student, then I'm not getting full training. Right. I, it's I'm losing out because I'm not getting to do that, that hard, full training. But I would make the argument that learning how to control your power is that's that's part of training. You, you should learn how to control that. Um, and so I think the ability to alter your intensity level is part of training. And it should be seen that way, not seen as a, oh, man, I have to like, I have to slow down for this, for this kid I'm fighting. Yeah. It, it, it's funny you bring up power. And, and, and I've heard this argument before. It doesn't come up very often. But the argument that, you know, I... I only go full force. I only go top speed. I only make it super real. And I don't like working with younger students or lower rank students because I don't have the opportunity to do that. Okay. If I ask you to perform, if, if we're doing basics, if we're doing basic techniques, and you know that we're doing 10 of them, we're doing 10 sidekicks, there's no way you're going full force on all of them. You cannot execute multiple concur or multiple uh, connected techniques more than two or three that are going to be full power and equally powerful across the set of 10. You are automatically going to tone that down. So once we establish that there is a time and a place to reduce speed, to reduce power as appropriate based on the training context, we can see that there are times where it's appropriate to do so with people because of their their skill or injuries or the desired aspect we're training because sometimes we're tr training a specific thing even if it's contact and and freeform and one of the keys with we'll say teenagers is that they might not have the life experience to know hey if i punch you in the face and you punch me back in the face, it might really hurt and I might break my nose and that may be bad because they're 13. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, we it's a good thing we have this in video for, yeah, for those of you who are listening. It's a good thing we have this in video because I can see that Andrew's wheels are turning, my wheels are turning and we're both trying to leave enough space for each other, but I'm sure we could both run for like 10 minutes and ramble. <laughs> The, the other the other side of the coin, though, is from the child's perspective, if there isn't communication about what's going on, um, either the adult is going to go full force and they're going to get hurt and they're yeah. and they're going to lose all the time, either a lose all the time and or get hurt, which means they're not going to come anymore. Right. They're done. You just lost a student. Right. That's one aspect. Or you are going to go easy on them. And they're not going to necessarily realize that's the case because they're 13 or 14 and don't realize what's going on. And they're going to get an inflated ego about, oh, I'm amazing because I just beat that black belt and I'm only a green belt or whatever. I've heard um, it happen. Yep. 
Absolutely. You probably and had it happen. Some kid scores a point on you and they think they're king of mountain. Yeah. And, but what that student doesn't realize, what that child doesn't realize is you're going easy on them and letting them so that they can progress a little bit right. and, and get some self-confidence maybe, but you have to be careful that you don't go overboard and so that's another side of the coin to think about. Right. Now, specifically, and let's let's dig in here and then let's start to pull back. We're talking about really more of a transition. I would imagine that once a teenager's been in the adult class for a period of time, six months, 12 months, they, they've wrapped their head around what's expected of them. And some some stasis has been reached, right? They, they, they know what's expected of them. Every, whether or not everybody likes it is a different story, but there has been some kind of adjustment period. Where is it most difficult? When those kids go from being the oldest and generally highest ranking students in the kids' class to the adult class. And you even alluded to it before that, or, or maybe it was in, in the question, that quite often they are higher rank than a lot of the adults. And so they're assuming that they step in as peers when they really don't. And here's the best way I, I think to look at this. What would you do with someone who came in from another school? You might respect their rank. You might respect their technique. But there would still be an integration period. You would still mm -hmm. make sure that people understood, hey, this is how we do it. No, no, not that way. This is how we do it. And again, it comes back to what you said at the beginning, open, clear communication. Absolutely. Yep. Because... The other thing to keep in mind, and this is for sure, this is more of an issue with smaller schools, right? If you've got a, mm. a school with a, a, a hundred students, you likely don't have this as much of an issue because you're able to have separate classes for teenagers. Um, but on that, if you don't have that luxury, uh, and and I train in I train in a very small dojo, um, you know, our, our we. Our classes, we've got a little itty bitty kids class for like three to five year olds. We've got a class for six to 12. And then 13 is 13 year olds 13 are in our up. adult class, yeah. right? Um, because we don't have that luxury. Because the other end of the, the other side of the token is if you consider that it's unfair to have a 13 or 14 year old who could be five foot three, five foot four, you know, uh, fighting with adults, is it fair to have that person, that 13 year old who's five foot four? fighting 10 year olds who are two and a half feet tall like that's not fair yeah. either no it's not it's not and there's no there's no perfect solution here no even, absolutely not even among schools and, and we have some that listen you know I've, I've talked to them i've taught at them even with schools that have a let's say a teen class the difference between a, a 13 year old and a 17 year old or an 18 year old is huge pot potentially physically huge mm -hmm. and developmentally can be just as big Yep. So it, really what we're talking about here, even though there's a specific around teens versus adults, what we're really talking about is how do you play up or play down, as I've heard it expressed in sports. Like I, I've got friends who play tennis and they talk about playing down so mm -hmm. that everybody can have fun and learn. And I think you can do the exact same thing in martial arts, again, with communication. Yep. In regards to the rank issue, um, if you have... Uh, you're absolutely right. If someone were to come in from another school, you know, there's this transition period. But again, you're discussing with them and they're understanding what's going on. I also think you may if you have a smaller school, you may want to consider if you have, let's say, a, a brown belt child coming into the adult class. Um, especially and I'm I'm thinking in terms of this harder style of sparring. Mm. I would probably not advocate a brown belt child, teenager, sparring against a white or green belt adult. That if that I would only have them spar against stu adults that are of the same r rank for two reasons. One, they're they the adult students that are underranked compared to this child. And mm -hmm. I don't mean ability. I'm no, not no, talking no, I, about I understand. ability. Um they're not going to have as much control typically as an adult with a higher rank. Sure. Uh, and so I think that it helps to delineate a little bit of the disparity between ranks because the child is only going to be fighting someone of the same rank or higher. Right. There is, there is something to be said when you work with a lower rank, whether we realize it or not, there's a maturity that has to happen there. If you, t 
no instructor is going to, well, I hope no instructor is going to take a first class white belt and pair them with that person in the school who's a jerk. And even though they have some rank, they hit a little bit too hard because we haven't gotten them to calm down yet. Yep. Why don't we do that? Why don't we put those two together? Because the older, higher rank, so to speak, student is lacking some maturity that is relevant in that context. It's quite often when I think about the schools that have problems with this, it's because partners are randomly assigned. And Absolutely. a good instructor, even when partners are randomly assigned, will see the problems coming and, all right, we're going to switch now. I want you and you to go together and then everybody else grab a partner. So you head it off. You make sure that the person who's problematic gets matched up with somebody who's not problematic. You avoid the problem and you go from there. Absolutely. Do we have anything else to say? I think we've, we've, we've kicked this one pretty well. Yeah. Oh, I God, think there, so. There's a, there's a pun that I hope we don't <laughs> lean into. Oh, I'm so sorry. I even said it. <laughs> Uh, and you can't rewind. I can't. I can't. This is we 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 try not to edit that stuff. Anything else you want to add? No, I I think that that pretty well sums it up. I mean, okay. uh, you know, so, some the other thing to keep in mind is that the child in class may very well not have the maturity to be able to stand up to the instructor and say, I'm not comfortable doing this. And so if they're going into a sparring situation that they're not comfortable with, mm. they're not going to be the ones to say, uh, I'm not sure what to do because this person is going to kick me really hard where, and they're just doing it because the teacher's telling them to do so. So I think it's important for the, like you said, the good instructors will recognize those things and, headed off at the past so that it doesn't happen. Yeah. And that would happen with communication. The best martial arts schools, and, and I did an episode on this a couple years ago. It, it finally clicked in for me. The best martial arts schools are one where the culture is of, uh, everyone is there to help everyone else train. Oh, good you're going to you're going to learn by consequence, right? Like just by being there, you're going to learn. But if you show up and you train and you make it about the other people, or if you're sparring partnered work, you make it about the other person. If everybody's doing that, there are far fewer problems. And, and I, I can I can think about the school specifically that I've learned the most at the ones I've learned the least at the ones where the most problems, the least problems. And it all falls on that division line. Where is your motivation coming from? Is it to benefit yourself or are you here in service to others? That's a great point. I hadn't thought of, I hadn't thought of that, but that's great. Hey, that's my job here, isn't it? Right. To come up with things nobody else thinks of. Make uh, you think. Educate. Ed educate and entertain. As I like right. to call it, edutain. Edutainment. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I think we've got got this one wrapped up. I, think it, I, I don't know how how I don't know how useful our discussion was for the particular question asker, but I hope it makes them think uh, uh, about it and you know come up with something if, that works for them. I think I would say if what we've talked about today is not helpful, I think it's because of likely of one thing, and that is there is a culture in the school where there is not communication where people are not used to speaking up and advocating for themselves and what they need and saying, hey, this doesn't work for me. And they go home bloody and bruised and patch themselves up and maybe they even miss a class and that's just part of the culture. And you know, there are schools like that and I'm not going to take anything away from anybody there. And if that's if that's the case, I don't know how to help with this one. Yeah, good point. All right. If anybody else has feedback, you know, we're, we're down to here. If you want to post it publicly, you've got a few places. You've got the Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio behind the scenes Facebook group. You've got uh, on the general Whistlekick page when episodes come out, we drop uh, there's a there's an automatic automatic an automatic man. I can't talk this morning. Uh, Facebook post that comes out. You can find it on on Twitter. Uh, and of course, this is episode 559. You can find it at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio dot com. We fixed most of the problems with the website that popped up recently, and we're almost done with a few more. So thank you for your patience if you're someone who has been missing the website. Uh, apparently, we've grown to the size where we are a target. And dealing with this constant bombardment has been a challenge. What else do I have to say? I got my notes. Here they are. 
All right. What did I miss? Uh, if you want to support us, you got the Patreon, you got leaving reviews, you can follow us on social media, you can do anything that might seem relevant. Share an episode. If this one, if you, if you, if you've heard somebody complaining about this specific problem, maybe you share this episode. Hey, those guys talked about this. Check it out. And if you make a purchase at whistlekick.com, you've got the code podcast15 to save you 15%. And if you see somebody out in their world wearing a, a whistlekick hat or a hoodie, Andrew, nor I are wearing anything with whistle kick on. Actually, that's not true. I have a, a t-shirt, a whistle kick t-shirt right now. I'm not going to semi disrobe to prove it. And if you have guest suggestions, topic suggestions, questions to ask, whatever it is, email me, Jeremy at whistlekick.com and I'll share it with Andrew, just like we did on this one. So you want to send this out? I can do that. All right. Take it. And as always, oh my gosh, why am Until I? Until next time, train, train hard, smile, and, and have, have a great, great day. day. <laughs>